Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's been a long day, so I must uh, congratulate you for sticking through. Um, my name is Mihai. Um, I run a game development agency called Amber. And the reason I chose this topic is because with, within our company, we are often asked by partners to uh, you know, push to the fringes and uh, you know, develop on the latest trends, on the latest technologies, platforms, and business models. So we're forced uh, to you know, constantly scour the market for new ideas. Um, and uh, in the process of doing that, I thought I'd share with you some of the things that we're currently looking at and what I consider to be very exciting. And the good news is that we, I don't have actually 101 uh, concepts for game innovation, uh, a subset of those, uh, but hopefully interesting stuff. So first of all, let's establish why it's important to innovate. So my take on this is, um, look, if you are a startup um, and you're pursuing an innovative, groundbreaking idea, you're far more likely to elicit interest from VCs. Um, there are constantly scouring the market for uh, companies that are trying to push the boundaries. Um, so I think um, you uh, would benefit, your, your startup benefit immensely if you are, uh, again, leading the charge and, and creating a new market or imagining a new market. Uh, second of all, um, if you, in the fight for talent, if you're doing something really cool, amazing, um, uh, you're much more likely to be able to attract uh, incredible people on your team. Um, such people, you know, brilliant minds, they want a big, hairy, uh, incredible uh, concept to latch onto and develop. Um, so, you know, I think uh, that makes sense. Um, also, uh, you're far more likely to attract partners. So, you know, large enterprises are looking at the market as well and trying to find you know, ideas that they can then cross-pollinate across their existing products or technologies. Uh, and these partners can be a source of funding, they can be a source of support, um, and they can um, uh, otherwise accelerate your, your growth. Uh, but the last and perhaps the most important thing is that um, karma is a, plays an important role here. You know, it is said that the future belongs to the bold. And if you are really pushing, <laughs> you're really out there, you know, sometimes the universe conspires to help you achieve what you have set out to do. Um, a good primer for, you know, following what happens in innovation in the technology field is Gardner's hype cycle for emerging technology. So really what I'm doing here is I'm taking a step backwards and looking at the entire technology space, not just games. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, there's a deep white paper that is written by Gardner on, on these technologies and comes out every year. So it's really cool to like follow. Um, if you haven't done so already. And what you see here is that you'll have technologies that are just entering the field right now. So for example, uh, artificial tissue or flying autonomous vehicles, they're just emerging and they're really uh, exciting and they are actually are attracting significant venture capital. Um, you know, in the news not that long ago that Atomico invested in a um, flying autonomous vehicle. Uh, company here in Europe. So super exciting stuff. There are some things that are at the peak of inflated expectations. So biochips, deep neural nets, carbon nanotubes, IoT platforms um, are, are certainly at the peak right now. And you know, in the trough of this disillusionment, you find things like mixed reality, augmented reality, VR. And um, anyway, it's really fascinating to follow this. Um, uh, this graph also is 2018, so I think things have already shifted in 2019. Um, and I look forward to, to reading uh, their take on it when it comes out, usually it comes out in the summer. Cool, so let me tell you what this talk is not about. The, so I consider these technologies to be uh, already emerged tech. Like in you know, virtual reality, we've been talking about it a lot, uh, including at this conference, uh, streamed games, Wearables really didn't have that much of an impact on games, but it's worth mentioning. Esports, super hyped and, and definitely growing. Uh, Location-based games and blockchain. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, you know, these, these technologies haven't necessarily reached full sophistication, full expression, but they really emerged, meaning that there are you know, many companies uh, playing in the field. Uh, it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily considered as groundbreaking ideas anymore. So what is really groundbreaking today? Neural networks play a very important role 
I think, in the continued development of the, of the game space. Games have always been pioneering AI research. Um, you know, NPCs in games have existed for many, for decades. Um, and obviously we've had very complex AI in strategy games. Um, I think this trend is likely to accelerate with the advent of unlimited computation in the cloud. So, you know, engines like Lumberyard um, and others. Um, and this will really allow games to personalize the player experience, the game responding in real time to player behavior and, and game choices. Um, synthetic reality is a concept that was proposed by Robert Walcott in 2017 in an academic paper. And I, I personally find this extremely exciting because we're talking about ever-evolving realities that are synthesizing our will. Um, you know, having a game that responds to your emotion in real time um, and to other stimuli, um, uh, procedural generation influenced by our individual personality. I think that is the next, um, you know, yeah, opportunity for, for incredible uh, advancement in, in games. Um, so it's worth thinking about it and it's worth uh, exploring. And one of the ways you can uh, capture that emotion is through this concept of neurogaming. Um, a leading figure in that field is Adam Ghazali at the Neuroscape Lab at USCSF. Um, and he has defined um, a means of reading your brain activity and feeding that into an interactive experience. So there's NeuroRacer. Um, designed to improve cognition in older adults um, and uh, what they call prescription gaming. So there's a practical health benefit from some of these uh, interactive experiences. There's a Kili um, digital medicine startup, um, Neurable, a brain controlled VR demo for a dystopic sci-fi game called Awakening. Um, and they're using a contraption uh, that you, with electrodes that you place on your brain and they're reading your brain activity. And it's interesting that within this like emerging ecosystem, there's already a venture capital firm that specializes in making these investments in neurogaming, and that's Jazz Venture Partners, also based in San Francisco. Um, uh, another concept that I find interesting, uh, again on the fringe, is alternate reality. And uh, for those of you that have read the, um, John Falls, uh, you know he has an amazing novel where you know, an individual's experience of the world is dramatically altered by those around him. And uh, transmedia storytelling has a lot of, contains a lot of substance that can be mined. Using the real world as a means to augment a digital interactive experience. Um, there has been experimentation in this space already. Uh, Majestic, if you, can, if you remember a game from the 90s, Majestic was um, an attempt to do so. And as the technology is evolved, um, I think we have increased means to, uh, to do that. It doesn't have to be a dystopian experience. It can be something that really enhances your participation and your um, uh, immersion, uh, if you want, in a game as your reality changes around you. And there are some principles for alternate reality um, that I've listed here. I really think you know, what I'm trying to do in this talk is to give you a primer for what we consider to be really interesting ideas and I really hope you can search further because I, I, I do think there are groups today in, uh, in academia and even private companies that are trying to push these concepts forward. Internet of Things, I mean obviously we've talked about it a ton um, and it hasn't really had a profound impact on gaming even though it could, like if, to, if, if we were to extend this concept of alternate reality um, so the world changing to your design then you can use IoT devices to create this effect. You know, we can have windows opening and closing, you can have uh, AC temperature fluctuations, lights flickering, TV turns on and starts playing a, a pre-recorded message. Um, you can simulate a haunted house, you can simulate a horror experience. I don't think any game has done that successfully to date and I think it's an amazing opportunity. Um, also live action role playing, um, you know, cosplay and uh, uh, LARP and uh, those things are well established, but I think augmented reality can play a, an interesting role here at enhancing the experience. So, you know, you can design AR, AR worlds where you ha can have a talking inspired fantasy or you can use the World of Darkness IP to, uh, to create a vampire lore. And this could be a way to create an urban scavenger hunt for the digital age. 
um, flick syncs. Uh, you might have uh, heard of this concept from Ready Player One, um, but it's not really an original idea of Ernest Klein. Um, uh, uh, the idea of a film simulation of the player's avatar um, um, is a movie character has already been bandied about, and you know, interactive movies are making like a really big entry right now through with Bandersnatch. Um, you know how amazing that was. But really, we've had interactive movies in the past, 1967, Kino Automat, Baradush Cinchera. Um, and in 1974, there was a game by Nintendo called Wild Gunman that used the you know, same principle. Um, and 1983, Dragon's Lair, um, a cartoon by Don Bloth, uh, a first commercial release of an interactive movie. And again, very rich area that can be further explored and you can tell very interesting stories of multiple endings. Um, science crowdsourcing. I think we're just scratching the surface of what we can do here. There's been a ton of, uh, you know, applications or, you know, gamified experiences that have been released in the past and have had a real impact. Um, this is that concept of citizen science, of games really making, uh, becoming a platform for scientific research. Um, University of Washington actually has a center of game science. It's very exciting. They've, um, you know, created some apps like Foldit that looks at protein folding, uh, Philo, aligning DNA sequences to solve evol evolutionary relationships, um, and so on and so forth. And the concept of business simulation is something that really animates us as well. Um, uh, there have been some games that <laughs> speak about the game development process, like Game Dev Story and Game Dev tycoon and uh, you know beyond the comical elements uh, associated with these games it actually does help you understand uh, at, you know if you're a profane uh, amateur uh, it does help you understand uh, how game development works and what are some of the pitfalls and some of the issues and you can extend that experience to really every kind of human activity and it can really be a very useful um, enterprise level training technique to use business simulation games or gamified learning experiences to, to teach. Right, so we hope to see more of those uh, happening and uh, outside in all areas of human activity. Um, also, games that address the human condition. Um, our, you know, we made an evaluation of the, the themes that are appear in games. And even though the past decade has been fabulous in, in that, uh, in that respect, we still feel that games haven't fully explored all facets of the human experience. And I'm listing, I've listed here a few that I think are still underrepresented, starting with sexuality, which continues to be a, a taboo uh, subject. And there's dysphoria um, that, uh, that came out, but there's there relatively few games that address sexuality in a mature and balanced and maybe profound way. Uh, mortality, mortality, the dragon, cancer, misery, uh, the Misery of War in this particular case, uh, This War of Mine by 11-Bit Studios, Grieving Left to My Own Devices, Relationships, Facade, you know, all of these are indie games, they're small games, sometimes created by a single person, and that alone tells you there's an opportunity to do more in that space and to expand um, the, the, you know, the infinite flavors of, of human nature and human condition. And last but not least, I think um, we are unwittingly all contributing to creating uh, the metaverse. Um, um, you know, the concept that Neil Stevenson introduced in Snow Crash. Um, and, uh, you know, we create MMOs, and I think if we take all of the technologies that I've mentioned in the past in this presentation, right? So, you know, the alternate reality, the neural networks, the, the synthetic reality concept of the games that are responding to your emotion, we can build a better metaverse. And I think uh, probably that's the kind of ultimate uh, expression of games uh, in the human experience. And that's it, not the 101, just gave you like <laughs> condensed version of that.